Good morning. How are you? You're surprised. I'm surprised to be here. This is uh, interesting how God works. I'm thankful for the way he works. We're going to be looking today at Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 through 17. I'm going to be reading from the ESV. Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 through 17. It's a familiar passage to you. When we get to it, you'll say, oh, yeah, I've, I've read this. And I, I know this passage. It's also found in Mark chapter 2, and it's also found in, Mark, uh, in Luke chapter 5. It's found in all of the synoptic gospels. So if it's said three times, it must be important. If it shows up three times, it must be important. The writer thought it was important. It's important. It is critical to Jesus' ministry. And I know you're going to be familiar with the passage, but you may not be familiar with the larger narrative it's a part of. In, Mark, in, in Matthew chapter 9, we're going to be reading the first encounter John's disciples have with Jesus. They're asking him a question. You will see a second encounter in Matthew chapter 11. And it's that encounter that this encounter sets up. And often we don't think about that. We see them as isolated events. But this is John's disciples talking to Jesus. It's the first encounter. Matthew chapter 11, there's a second encounter. We'll only be reading 9, through, uh, 9, 14 through 17 ESV. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Then verse 16 is the, the transition. He tells a parable. So it's in the context of the question, why do they fast or don't fast? The parable is in the context of asking why they fast and don't fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and, the worst tear, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins, for if it is, the, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But put new wine into a fresh wineskin, so both are preserved." So understand something of the context here. After declaring Jesus is the Lamb of God and baptizing him in the Jordan, this question's raised. John saw Jesus in John chapter 1, remember? Behold, the Lamb of God, it takes away the sin of the world, and two of his disciples left him to follow Jesus. John is a cousin. John knows him. John baptized him. He heard heaven speak. He saw a dove descend. Do you think there would be any question in his heart who Jesus is? You, you think it's pretty fairly fixed who he is. And yet we have this question happening. John the Baptist now is in prison. He's in prison because he's an ethical man, a godly man, and he had confronted Herod about his sin. And when you confront the king about your sin, you get to go to jail. He went to jail. He's in jail, but the sad and bad thing about this for John is he cannot watch Jesus. He has no idea what's going on out there. So his disciples are watching Jesus, they're with Jesus, and then they're coming back and bringing a report. This occasions this gathering. They brought back a report. They said to John, they don't fast. They're not fasting. And obviously, John's concerned about this, and he's trying to figure it out. As John receives these reports, conflicts begin to arise in his heart. He was a prophet. He had denied himself luxury, comfort, certain foods, and drink. Luke chapter 1 talks about this. Mark chapter 1 talks about this. But John's disciples are telling him that Jesus is gathering with sinners, feasting and not fasting. And to make it more confusing, he's even not obeying the rules of the Pharisees. So don't you think John's a little bit like, what is going on here? He's lived his life a certain way. God has honored that life. And now Jesus, who he thought was the one, is not living as he lived. So finally, to try to resolve this conflict, he sends his disciples to ask Jesus if he is the Messiah or if Israel should be looking for someone else. This is the Matthew 11 encounter. That's where this is going. It is going where John is so in doubt, he's wondering if he made a mistake. Yeah, see, we don't always see the narrative context. Remember, John's already identified him as a lamb of God and so much more, and yet, even in that assurance, something's happening in John. So what is going on? The text we've just read is part of John's quest for understanding. And here we find his disciples questioning Jesus specifically about one thing. Only one thing is a topic here. Why aren't you fasting? It's in this context that he talks about the wine and the wineskins, the garment and the patch. So they come to him and they ask him why you don't fast. Regarding that question, Jesus says, well, fasting is associated with mourning. And no one mourns when the bridegroom's here. Everybody's happy. We party. We have a great time. When the bridegroom leaves then we fast. That's all he gives to their answer. I'm not sure how helpful that was. I mean, it, later it'll become very helpful. But right now, I don't know if they go, oh, well, got it. Can't wait to get back to John. 
Then he goes into this parable. And you know parables, the, the rule of interpreting a parable. It's not always about the words that are spoken, it's about what they mean. And so he talks about this new wine and new wine skins. It's something they knew about. They knew about animal skins that had been used. Sheep or goat skins had been used for all kinds of liquids, including wine. They knew that wine ferments, that it expands, and if you don't have a good wine skin that will expand, it will burst. And if it bursts, you lose the wine. You don't want to lose the wine. You want to keep the wine, so you use a new wine skin with new wine. Simple rule. They got it. They knew that. But what's it got to do with now? Jesus' teaching here is profound. Jesus was doing something completely new. If John or anyone else tried to make sense of it by comparing it to what God did in the past and how God did it in the past, they would miss the new wine. John was doing what you and I do. We can't do that. Why? We've never done that. That's not what we do. That's not what the church does. The church doesn't do that. You'd never have drums on the platform. <laughs> new wine. If anyone expected Jesus' ministry to resemble what God had done before, they would absolutely miss the new work God was doing. The problem here is wine and wineskins. John was measuring Jesus through old wine and an old wineskin. I don't know what his wineskin was, but it might be that his wineskin was something about Jesus restoring the kingdom of Israel to Israel. Because we know that came up in Acts 1. The disciples had lived with Jesus for three years. They had seen all the miracles. They saw everything he did. He died. He was buried. He was rose from the dead. That is big. He's now about to ascend into heaven. And what do they say as he gets ready to ascend? Is it now you're going to give us everything, the kingdom? We're going to be political? He was so kind when he said, it's not for you to know the day or the hour. Maybe John was there. Maybe that was John's paradigm. Well, why is he living like he's living and not living like he should? We must all be like of Issachar, men who, understanding of the times, they knew what Israel ought to do. First Chronicles 12.32. That's who we must be. We must be as the Bereans that receive the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things are true. Acts chapter 17. That is the call in our lives today. Never more critical than today. That we be discerning of our days and we understand the scriptures so that we can mesh them together. We can bring them together and have fuller understanding about what God is doing. We are in a new day, and God is doing a new work. And we, with respect to the church, models and methods to accomplish his mission, the old has passed away, and new, all things are new. Everything has changed for the church today. There's no going back to how it used to be and how we used to do it. And so I've had some of my pastor friends tell me, when are we going to be back to normal? And I said, you are in your new normal. This is it forever, or until it changes again. <laughs> to put it another way, the pandemic alone has and continues to force reflection, conversation, prayer, adaption, innovation, and most importantly, assessment of the sustainability of all models of ministry. This is in the U.S. and around the world. The pandemic alone, this is not the political stuff, not the, separate, the divisions in our political parties, wars and rumors of wars, all that, all of that aside, just the pandemic has required this conversation. So the church is exploring whether we have effectively ministered the gospel to increasing numbers of peoples, plural, because I'm speaking now about people groups, not people like me, but people different than me. Are we effectively ministering the gospel to numbers of peoples in our community with the result that they confess Jesus as Savior? Well, what we see is some churches growing, and they say they have converts, but I want to be honest, and I'm not being cynical. We need to explore if they're converts, because I hear of people coming back to Jesus, which I love to see happen. And if you need to come back, please come back. Don't hear this as not being negative. Please come back. Yeah. But that isn't the same as reaching into your community and winning people who've never known Jesus. And what I see by the statistics is however much a single, a single church is growing, we are not growing faster than population, which means we're having no impact. And we have to wrestle with this. We have to understand this. We have to feel this. We have to determine if we're effectively making biblically defined, healthy, reproducing disciples. Yes. I'm not sure we are. Why? Because when the pandemic hit, we sent everyone back to their neighborhoods, and how few knew what to do. Wow. They, were, they wanted to get back together and meet in the barn and get their kids in the class, and they wanted to have their worship services. Yes. It was about gathering. It wasn't about being dispersed and sent wow. and being in a neighborhood now where I'm the only thing I can do is minister to my neighbors. 
I wonder if we made disciples. We did disciple them to arrive on time. We did disciple them to get in the building on time. We discipled them to tithe when they needed to, to give money to their offerings to get their kids and pick them up. They can do that. But we left our neighborhood so quickly to get back into a building. We're measuring whether or not we've been fruitful in multiplying healthy, reproducing congregations and crossing the barriers that are, that are around us to reach more ethne. No, we haven't. We're not planting churches. We're not planting churches. There aren't more churches. There are fewer churches today. There are few church, fewer churches today than there were 10 years ago. And that's because big churches are the thing. God bless this church that decided to get small again. To get in the neighborhood again. To begin to rethink even what the gathering looks like. Hallelujah. Are we effectively sending workers to go into all the world to make disciples and serve global ministry? Well, I'll tell you, if you're not sending them to the neighborhood and they won't go, they're probably not going to places around the world. Probably not. So with respect to the Great Commission, and I'm speaking about this expansively, which would include witness, evangelism, discipleship, mobilization, and celebration, the whole of the work. Have you been contending for the peoples around the world? Have you been contending for the peoples in the U.S. and around the world who have yet to hear the good news? As Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Do you realize the second coming of Jesus is somehow inextricably linked with the proclamation of the gospel to every peoples? You keep waiting for Jesus to come. You're looking up. You want him to come. Well, until everybody's heard, he's not coming. Matthew 24, 14. He loves people too much to leave them here. Much more than we love them sometimes. Have you been passionately praying hard for the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers into the field? Matthew 9, 37 and 38. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Have you been praying that prayer? Do you pray every day that laborers will be sent to the harvest? God, send someone. God, to send somebody. Do you read your paper reading that when you read about a nation that's at war? God, send somebody there. You read about a tribal group someplace arguing about something. God, they need Jesus. Send somebody there. Are we praying? Have you been praying, fasting, and seeking God for his direction for your life? Because you are one of the laborers. And what does he want to do with you? You know he has something for you in this kingdom. You know that. So Matthew 28, 19, and 20 me, are for you. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Also, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. As each has received a gift, let it use, use that gift to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Why? Peter finishes with this, in order that everything, that in everything, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God is answering these prayers. And you know what the result of the answer? New wine. The question we have is, are we willing to make the wineskins? That's our, that's our requirement. We have to decide about the wineskin. Because we can't have new wine without the wineskin. Because God won't waste his good wine. He'll pass us by. I want you to think about it specifically with respect to people's languages and cultures. First, U.S. immigration and then global people migration. U.S. immigration, of course, is people getting into the United States either documented or undocumented. When I say that here in Southern California, we mostly think about Mexico, but let me tell you, there are French Canadians in New Hampshire that didn't get in here legally. Airports around the nation are the places of illegal transitions. We got folks, we got students in this country that have overstayed their visa and have never gone in to get it fixed. We've got lots of people here undocumented and they aren't all Hispanic. Immigration, they're in the country. And then global people movements. A huge one's happening right now from Haiti. Haiti to South America, South America to the Darien Crossing, the most dangerous strip of land in the Northern Hemisphere and probably in the world to get into Panama, to come up through Central America, into Mexico, to the U.S. border to try to get in. People migrations mean people are moving from one place to another. U.S. immigration means they've come from some place to another. 
Think about this. One example of this. Could it be that instead of casting immigration and these people migration as political, economic, law enforcement, or public safety matters, instead of talking about terrorists and Muslims and Islam and being warned by commentators on TV that they're coming to your neighborhoods, maybe we could look at it as wine. Maybe it's wine. Maybe it helps us to lift our eyes from the political way of seeing these immigrants and see how God is bringing people of the world to us to serve and disciple them. Because we couldn't get to them, God loved them enough to bring them to us. What if? What if? It's, it's a simple redefinition. It's, it's not, it's, it's wine. And now I need to consider a wineskin. Let me give you an example of this. In the last two decades, more than 97,000 Afghans have been resettled in the U.S. You're hearing about it now because of what happened in Afghanistan. But 97,000 are already here. 97,000 Afghans are already in this country. We anticipate, according to um, U.S. News and other things, that 95,000 uh, 95, Afghans should be in this country by the end of September. But that's not all of them, because we know others will continue to come as they get papers in Afghanistan, and lots of people went to the borders, and they will work their way here like people do. So right now, we're around 200,000 Afghans, Afghanis living in the United States of America. Afghanistan is one of the darkest closed countries in the world. It's a, it's a nation, as of this morning when I ran the numbers, it's a nation of 39,000, 39,624,000, of which 1% could be Christian, which means that there's probably 2,000 believers of some kind in this nation, and they're part of only two tribal groups because of the 69 tribal groups only 67 might have heard, might have heard, which means there's only 2,000 believers in Afghanistan, but 200,000 are brought to a nation with churches, and Christians aren't at the front of the line to receive them because... They didn't see them as wine, and so there was no need for a wineskin. You see, you can't fix something you don't see. You can't partner with what doesn't exist. You can't gather what isn't being given. What if it's wine? What if these Afghanis have been brought here from many of these 69 tribes that have never heard once the gospel to be one to Jesus? What if that is what God is doing here? What if God is... Is, is mobilizing his church, perhaps, perhaps in ways never done before, so that we could see God do something great in winning a nation that's 90% Sunni Muslim, 10% Shiite Muslim, with maybe 2,000 believers. So who's ready? Well, disciples who can see are ready. Disciples who love wine are ready. And they love to build wineskins already. But disciples, uniquely, disciples who are bilingual, trilingual, quadlingual, those disciples can be ready. Because when we think about Southern California, and particularly Orange County, there's a lot of folks here that, that speak English and other languages. Right now, the main languages in Orange County are Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, both Mandarin and Cantonese, Korean, Tagalog, Japanese, Arabic, Persian, Farsi, and Dari, Hindi, Russian, German, um, let's see, anything else? Yeah, that's pretty good. Armenian, in fact, I pulled two lists because it was kind of funny. French, Creole, Italian, Portuguese, German, Yiddish, Greek, Polish, Serbo-Croatian, Ukrainian, other Slavic languages. That, that's in Orange County, the land of Disneyland. It's a small world, indeed. <laughs> Indeed, it's a small world. So, so I wonder, how many of you speak English conversationally or fluently? Okay, how, how many of you speak English in one other language conversationally or fluently? Raise it high. Look around you. How many of you speak English fluently and two other languages? Raise your hand. Okay, okay, anybody else? Okay, because there's some two. How about three? English and three other languages. Anybody speak English in three other languages? Ah, back in the back, okay. Let's take a risk. Anybody speak four? English and four? Haroon, I'm looking at you wondering. Yes, you do. Now, why? 
so you can work at the post office? So you can get a great job translating in the court system? Or because you know Jesus and now you can jump a fence and tell someone about Christ? So you're ready. You're ready. And the start is in this building right now. Because if you can do it in English, you can do it in any of those other languages. And then, who's got the connections? Who, who's got the connections to build the bridge? Who's got, who can find the person of peace? I, wa- I want you to think of relationships you have with someone of another language or culture, someone who's different than you. Sometimes you can't tell by looking at them, but you hang out with them and you realize they're, they're not from around here. Think, think of your relationships. And don't just think about people at work in your neighborhoods and schools. I want you to think everybody you know. Like the barista that knows the kind of car you drive, and when you drive up, knows your drink, and starts your venti quad white chocolate mocha, no whip, no foam, 180 degrees, well stirred before you get in the building. (laughs) That's my drink of choice. (laughs) (laughs) But your barista knows you better than you know your barista. What if your barista is a person of peace? Who are the people in your life that can become a bridge to other people groups in Southern California? Who can you reach? I wonder if anyone was in the military. I wonder if they were in the military and served in this long war in Afghanistan and who there became familiar with Pashto or or Dali, the two languages of Afghanistan. Anybody here speak Pashto? Harun? No? (laughs) Harun, do you know anybody that speaks Pashto? That means this church is ready to translate services to the Afghanis if anyone invites them over. That's how close we are to doing this. You just have to like wine. And then you have to want to do the work to build your wine skin so you don't lose it. If we miss this new wine and wine skins, it would not be the first time. I sat with a dear pastor friend. Older me, older than me, many years in ministry, I said, sir, tell me something you, you regret. So tell me what you've learned. He began to weep instantly. Instantly. He said, I miss the Jesus movement. I knew that God wasn't going to work through long-haired kids that didn't wear shoes. I knew. I knew their music was not of God. It was nothing like the music of the church. I knew that sitting on the floor, you're not going to come into church to sit on the floor. You're not going to come in and walk in our carpet barefoot. So I taught my church to hate them too. And none of the young people came to our church, and we were so proud of that. And he's weeping, and he says, but I missed it. And I said to him, well, is that why you're what I would call now an early adopter to any move of God? Because I've noticed whenever God's doing something, you're there. Even if it's wrong, you're there. You, you, you correct later. Because that's how he is. He would, he would get engaged, and then if he found out it wasn't balanced, he'd step away, but he got engaged. And he said, Jim, I've made a decision. I'm never going to miss another move. So we could miss this, folks. We could miss this moment. It's not about Afghanistan. It's about wine. All the wine that's out there that needs to be gathered, wine skins that need to be built, and whether or not we are willing to build the wineskin. Father, we come to you in the powerful name of Jesus, and I pray for us, all of us, that, Lord, we will realize that there are moments that come and go, that those koinonia moments that we talk about so much, so, so much in the Bible, this moment the door opens and it closes. We're at that kind of a moment right now. So, Jesus, I pray you would speak to us. Make us be the people you want us to be. I know you love this, Lord, because you're the one that told us to go into all the world making disciples of every nation, whether they're out here or they're out there. In Jesus' name.